ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Centre for International Governance Innovation, or CG as we say. My name is Una Fitzgerald, and I'm the director of the International Law Research Program at CG. I would like to thank our public event sponsor, Wordsworth Books, for their ongoing support of the CG Signature Lecture Series. Thanks also to all of you for joining us at this event. Um, whether you are here in person or online, uh, joining us through the webcast. I just want you to know that following this evening's address by Professor Michael Trebilko, we will welcome questions from both audiences at the microphones at the front of the auditorium or through the live chat function on your screen. So please remember to state your name and to keep the questions brief. It is a great pleasure for me and an honor to introduce Michael Trebilko, who will talk to us today about his fascinating award-winning book, Dealing with Losers, The Political Economy of Policy Transitions. You may know that with this book, Michael won the 2015 Donna Prize for outstanding public policy, uh, an outstanding public policy book written by a Canadian. So who is Michael Trebilko? He is a professor of law and chair in law and economics at the Faculty of Law at University of Toronto. He's also been a visiting professor at Yale Law School, University of Chicago Law School, Harvard Law School, New York University Law School. He's internationally renowned in the field of law and economics, in addition to international trade law, law and development, competition law, economic and social regulation, and contract law and theory. And he has published widely in all these topics. Professor Trebilko came to Canada in 1969 as a visiting associate professor of law at McGill Law University and joined the University of Toronto at, in 1972. Before McGill, he was a law professor at the University of Adelaide in South Australia. Prizes that have been won by Professor Trebilko are numerous. I've already mentioned that he's the 2015 Donna Prize winner. Uh, in 2015, sorry, that was 2015, he also has won this year the J.J. Barry Smith Doctoral Supervision Award from the University of Toronto in recognition of his outstanding performance in the multiple roles associated with doctoral supervision. And um, in the International Law Research Program, we have uh, a couple of students who, um, a postdoc and uh, one of his doctoral students, and all we hear is glowing praise for uh, Professor Trubilko from these students. <clears throat> in 2010, Professor Trubilko won the Ontario Premier's Discovery Award for Social Sciences. In 1998, he won the Canada Council Molson Prize in the Humanities and Social Sciences. He's a recipient of the Warren Owen Prize in 1989, um, for legal research for his book, The Common Law of Restraint of Trade. He has been elected a, professor, a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada in 1987, and he was elected an honorary foreign fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1999. Michael Trebilko and my paths have crossed at times, but never more so than since I joined CG a year and a half ago. Um, he is widely regarded as a great doctoral supervisor, but I did not have the fortune of having him as my supervisor. Um, but I must say that since I came to CG, I am seeing more of Michael Trebilko in his many roles, both as a supervisor of students and also as a, a great thinker on issues of international law and economics. Now, when I read Michael Trebilko's book, I realize that our interests converge to a considerable degree on the interesting questions about how to progress on challenging global issues while fairly addressing the interests of losers in policy transition. Having myself been inside the sausage factory of government policy making and seen the practical difficulties in making policy reforms, Michael's pragmatic approach speaks with great resonance to me. Michael's reflections on international trade, climate change, and law and development will be invaluable to the International Law Research Program as we pursue our policy focused 
research on challenging questions of international economic law, international intellectual property law and innovation, and international environmental law and related cross-cutting issues. Michael's work shows us the importance of vision, strategy, opportunity, and compromise in making progress on some of the toughest political, social, and economic issues confronting global society today. People speak of wicked problems. Well, wicked problems call for wicked solutions. And Michael Trebilko shows us you, that you have to roll up your sleeves and get dirty to solve problems, such as reversing climate change with equity, prosperity, and solidarity. I invite you to enjoy his presentation, and may it strengthen your own resolve in addressing the many intractable problems we face. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Una, for that enormously uh, generous and, uh, and uh, excessively flattering introduction. And thank you ever so much to CG uh, for the honor and privilege of um, presenting this lecture tonight. Uh, I have uh, spent uh, much of my professional career researching, writing, and teaching about the policy reform process in a wide range of uh, policy contexts. But I have not uh, just been a scholar in an attic uh, at a university. I've also, in many contexts, been an active participant in the policy reform process as a member of government commissions, task forces, research directors thereof, and so on. So I'd like to think I've uh, um, not only been able to pursue opportunities of thinking and writing about these things, but also been on the policy uh, front lines. And I've repeatedly been struck in many, if, if not most of these contexts, by the realization that diagnosing the ills of the status quo and imagining better policy alternatives, at least in their bro broad contours, uh, is not uh, often especially controversial. One can see that the status quo is uh, highly unsatisfactory or dysfunctional, and one can imagine at least the outlines of a better world out there. But the real challenge lies in getting from here where we are to there. Over time, existing policies develop their own encrustations of institutions, vested interests, adaptive preferences, and expectations that render the trajectory of getting from here to there a major part of the policy challenge. Uh, as an aside, um, to tell you what the book is not about, uh, last week, I was complimenting a close friend and long-standing colleague at the University of Toronto in a recent book he's published in, by email and offering to send him the paperback version of my book, which uh, is about to be released. And he said, I've already been promoting it around the world, but I've been doing so by telling people it's a thinly disguised personal memoir of your life in this faculty, <laughs> dealing with people like uh, me and other colleagues. Uh, well, uh, uh, this book is not about life uh, over the past four decades at the University of Toronto Law School. I wouldn't have the audacity to call it dealing with losers. <laughs> <laughs> I would probably call it dealing with winners, the challenge of dealing with academic prima donnas and chronic procrastinators. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm dealing with a, a number of, uh, uh, in my talk tonight and in the book, a number of um, highly salient public policy uh, dilemmas. But I start the book um, with, uh, I think, a very striking historical example of the problem of getting from here to there. Uh, 
the uh, long fight to end slavery, led by William Wilberforce, amongst many others, culminated in Britain with the enactment of the Slavery Abolition Act in 1833. This act made provision for a payment of 20 million pounds, almost 40% of the British budget at the time, in compensation to plantation owners in many British colonies. This is about 21 billion US dollars in present day terms. Moreover, only slaves below the age of six were initially freed, while others were redesignated as apprentices to be freed in uh, two stages a few years later. Uh, Wilberforce and many other abolitionists accepted that compensation and phased implementation was required to ensure enactment of the legislation, particularly by the House of Lords where plantation owners were heavily represented amongst the aristocracy. Now, this is a very uh, striking uh, case, uh, and it, um, I think it sheds light on many contemporary public policy issues. Whenever governments change policies, whether they're tax policies, expenditure policies, or regulatory policies, even when the changes on some reasonable view are on balance or on net socially beneficial, there will typically be losers uh, from the policy changes who have made investments of one kind or another predicated on or even in many cases deliberately induced by the pre-reform set of policies. And they will feel, um, not surprisingly, aggrieved uh, by the policy reforms proposed. So the issue that's central to my book is wh whether and when to mitigate the cost associated with policy changes, whether through explicit government compensation, grandfathering, uh, phased implementation, postponed implementation, because this issue is ubiquitous across the policy landscape, and if not addressed squarely and honestly and frankly, is likely in many cases to derail the reform process as the losers or perceived losers mobilize to oppose the reforms. So um, looking for compromises, looking for appropriately tailored transition, what I call transition cost mitigation policies that mitigate some of the costs sustained by the losers uh, really is an essential part of the process of moving forward. Now, many of us, uh, as we think about it, will realize this uh, pr um, problem arises um, uh, in many, many contexts. Well, take, uh, let me give some uh, common uh, examples. Land use regulations or controls. Sometimes governments choose to change these regulations. They may increase setbacks from property lines or road allowances. They may impose new height restrictions on buildings in uh, residential or mixed-use areas. They may change zoning laws from mixed-use to residential. In most of these cases, existing property owners will be exempted uh, from these requirements, in effect grandfathered and their ex uh, u existing uses treated as non-conforming uh, uses. Environmental regulations are another case in point. Energy efficiency regulations uh, or requirements for motor vehicles are an example, uh, requiring in increased uh, fuel efficiency. Typically, these do not apply to the existing fleet of vehicles, right? They apply to uh, vehicles to be made at some, some point in the future going forward in order to give uh, manufacturers uh, time to uh, lead time to adapt to these regulations. Uh, I think a more controversial example, uh, more re relevant in the US than here, is a reform, a reform of gun control laws. 
even strong proponents of stricter gun control laws in the uh, US that would um, impose a comprehensive background checks on the, or purchases of guns or prohibit the prohibition of assault rifles or magazines in excess of a certain capacity. Recognize that uh, these uh, requirements, if adopted, could only feasibly apply to prospective purchases of firearms, not existing owners of firearms, who in effect would be grandfathered. Another example, cutting a little closer to home, uh, many professions, uh, including law, dentistry, medicine, others, over the past century have adopted increasingly stringent professional qualification requirements. I think we're all intuitively aware of this. But this means, of course, that older practitioners are typically grandfathered from these requirements. And we, and we kind of live with that. We know we can't tell you to go back to law school if you graduated from law school 30 or 40 years ago and do a more rigorous degree or go back to medical school 30 or 40 years after being admitted. We accept that we can only move uh, incrementally and in stages We're going forward. Another example, uh, um, which, which is, uh, I think, a, a difficult example, is found in so-called post-conflict uh, societies, like South Africa, Rwanda, or other uh, such countries where there has been major civil uh, conflict in the past, and there is a challenge as to what should be done regarding uh, atrocities committed in the past by various antagonists um, in the conflicts that have afflicted a nation, right? Do we say, well, the, the law is the law, and the law applies going back as well as going forward? In fact, we don't do this, typically. Uh, we employ a judicious combination, or these countries have employed a judicious combination of truth and re reconciliation commissions. You confess and avoid, so to speak. Uh, lustration policies that disqualify um, officials, certain officials from previous repressive regimes from holding public office going forward. And residual classes of cases where the most egregious atrocities might be subject to criminal prosecution, say, before international, the International Criminal Court. But these, this mix of policies designed to sort of draw a qualified line on the sand between the past and the future, right? What happened in the past is the past, and we're operating under a new set of rules going forward. So, um, the need to take uh, measures like this seriously in most policy contexts, I think, stands in relatively uh, sharp contrast to two uh, long-standing traditions in economics, uh, which have tended to marginalize this issue. And I'm critical of both of these traditions. One tradition, very common and mainstream amongst economists, is to examine some public policy in place, uh, to do a quantitative empirical assessment of the social costs and benefits and reach conclusions that the costs vastly exceed the benefits and the policy is a disaster and should be immediately repealed. It could be rent control laws, uh, various taxes, um, uh, regulations of uh, agricultural policy regulations of one kind or another. Uh, so the academic uh, journals, economic journals, are full of these studies, right? Uh, assessing the social uh, costs and benefits alternative of alternative um, policies, and typically finding that existing policies are grossly inefficient in many contexts. Now, the assumption appears to be that once these studies are published in the American Economic Review or the Journal of Political Economy, somehow or other they'll filter through to our elected political representatives who are well-intentioned but ill-informed, and the moment uh, they are apprised of these new findings, will immediately espouse them and repeal the offending policies. <laughs> 
Uh, this, in fact, rarely happens. An alternative assumption seems to be, well, even if the politicians are not well-intentioned, albeit ill-informed, uh, the citizenry will now be well informed on the publication of this new empirical study, and an aroused citizenry will kick the rascals out, right? It's a venal politicians captured by special interest groups will pay a price at the polls. This again only rarely happens. So uh, I call this the social welfare tradition in economics. Look at the social costs and benefits of policies and uh, see whether the benefits exceed the costs, and if they don't, decry the policies. <coughs> but pretend the politics doesn't exist, right? But pretend the politics doesn't exist. Now, another tradition in uh, economics does take politics seriously and does not pretend that politics does not exist, it's often called public choice theory. It tends to view the existing policies in place as we observe them, however socially dysfunctional in some sense, as the best we can achieve in, the, uh, in a world not populated by angels, right? Venal politicians, self-interested voters, um, self-centered bureaucrats, etc., etc. These are all the non-angels. Um, so, in this kind of incestuous relationship between politicians, regulators, bureaucrats, rent-seeking special interest groups, we get all kinds of socially perverse policies. Uh, that's true, that's politics in the raw, that's the way it really works, and there's nothing we can do about it. Go home and have a good night's sleep and then try and change something that can't be changed. Well, this is also kind of unhelpful. And it also seems to fly in the face of many policy changes that uh, I and many of you in the audience have observed over the past 20 or 30 years the privatization of many state-owned enterprises, deregulation of many sectors of the economy, like the telecommunications sector. Um, and on the other hand, the dramatic growth in environmental health, health and safety regulation over the same period, right? The, these are significant policy shifts, less government in one ca uh, case, more government in, in another case. So, uh, with this, uh, these unhelpful strands of thinking about mitigating the tr transition costs associated with getting from, here, uh, from A to B, from here to there, the social welfare economists pretending that these costs don't exist, and the public choice theorists saying these costs are so crippling you can't expect anything better out of the political process. Uh, I think uh, we uh, observe in many policy contexts a lack of systematic thinking about what set of policies uh, realistically and appropriately can address uh, these transition costs and move us forward, maybe not from a bad state of affairs to nirvana, but from a bad state of affairs to something better. Not making the perfect the enemy of the good. So in the um, book, I devote, I know, 20 uh, pages or so per chapter to one of, uh, um, to uh, seven different case studies which I examine in in more detail than the examples I've just been uh, presenting to you. And I want to comment in the bulk of my lecture tonight on these case studies, all of which I think are of highly contemporary salience. The first one is a trade policy. Over the post-war uh, period, beginning with the formation of the GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade in 1947, 
tariffs, tariffs on manufactured goods have fallen on average from something close to 50%, 50% in 1947, to a little more than 3% today. That's over a 60-year period. This is dramatic. But notice it didn't happen overnight. It happened over uh, nine negotiating rounds that were held every decade or so. Um, and even within rounds, tariff reductions were often phased in over an eight or 10 year period. So both within rounds and across rounds, these tariff cuts were gradual. It's what I call the principle of gradualism. You don't cut a 50% tariff to zero tomorrow and uh, devastate an industry that has enjoyed long-standing um, trade protection and, and, uh, would in, and face massive, uh, entail massive job layoffs. So gradualism. Secondly, something that economists claim they can understand, reciprocity. That is, why do we, when we reduce tariffs on imports into Canada, why do we insist on our trading partners offering um, reciprocal concessions. If, it, if it's in our own interest to cut tariffs on imports, it makes goods cheaper for consumers. Why do we ask other countries to do anything in return? Well, it turns out that reciprocity is important in mitigating transition costs. That is, some sectors we're going to cut tariffs. That means there'll be more imports coming in. These domestic industries will contract over time. But if our trading partners make similar concessions in other sectors, we will have other industries, export-oriented industries, that are expanding. So resources over time, including um, labor, can migrate from con um, contracting um, import-affected domestic industries into export-oriented domestic industries. So reciprocity is key to mitigating the transition costs associated with liberalizing trade policy. And finally, in the GATT, from day one, um, there has been a provision called the Safeguard Provision that permits importing countries to reinstate previous levels of tariff protection where they have been confronted with an unexpectedly severe import surge causing significant injury to a domestic industry and its workforce. You can reinstate the previous levels of protection for a limited period of time to mitigate the impacts. So gradualism, reciprocity, and reversibility have been absolutely key to what I regard as one of the under-celebrated success stories in international policy making in the post-war period, and that is international trade liberalization. One of the great success stories in international policy making in the post-war period. But these three elements, gradualism, reversibility, and reciprocity have been key to this success story. Now I come uh, to a major exception to the happy story I've been telling you on trade liberalization, and that is the persistence of high levels of trade protection in the agricultural sector, both here and in many other countries. Uh, this is, again, a highly uh, salient uh, uh, current issue. Uh, Canada, along with seven or eight other countries, were attempting to negotiate a Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. And one of the key demands that Canada is facing from our uh, trading partners partners in these negotiations is that we reduce the high level of protectionism of some of our agricultural sectors, but particularly our dairy sector. And the dairy sector in Canada, uh, since the early 1970s, has enjoyed extraordinarily high levels of tariff protection. T tariffs on imported dairy products, not just fluid milk, but cheese and yogurt and the like, run at somewhere between 250 and 300 percent. This is staggering, right? The average tariff, I told you, on manufactured products is 3 percent. 
250, when you go and buy milk or cheese or yogurt um, in the uh, supermarket, uh, you are implicitly paying a tax on these products of 250 to 300%. This is like a, a hidden sales tax. Imagine if the sales tax were explicit, you would freak out, wouldn't you? Right? The, the teller says, you know, the milk, I know it's a dollar a liter, but on top of that, there's, uh, there's another two dollars in taxes. But that's an effect, uh, how the system works. Um, dairy farmers have to buy quotas that permit them to produce milk. The average dairy farmer in Canada has paid or borrowed money from uh, the bank two million dollars to buy these quotas. So every dairy farmer, about 13,000, got two million dollars invested in this piece of paper. And I'm not talking about the dairy farm or the cattle or the physical assets or the machinery. I'm talking about this piece of paper that says you can produce this many liters of milk a day. This will cost you two million dollars to buy that quota. The total value of quotas milk quotas in this country is somewhere in the 25 to 28 billion with a B dollars. So if this scheme were terminated overnight, I predict with total confidence there would be social and political mayhem, right? There would be endless uh, protests on Parliament Hill in Ottawa and at Queen's Park. Dairy farmers would close down the legislature of not the cities and would argue that, in effect, termination of the scheme is tantamount to expropriation, expropriation of a large percentage of their wealth. So here is a major policy dilemma. The scheme is inefficient, it's uh, regressive, it taxes poorer families disproportionately more on, uh, on the uh, food budgets. It's bad policy. But the issue is not, is it bad policy? The issue is, how the hell do we get out of it? And the current government is facing this issue right now, right? And I think if it insists that we will give nothing on the dairy front, uh, Canada, I expect, will uh, have to leave the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations. Other countries will not accept a do nothing, give nothing approach. I myself have proposed, and I'm not sure anybody's listening, uh, that a gradual phase out of tariffs from the 250 to 300% level over time, right? Could be 10, 15 years. Complemented by partial compensation. I would not pay the dairy farmers the current market value of their quotas, which have been grossly inflated by the restrictive policies they employed, but rather what they paid to acquire them, right? The acquisition cost, book value, what their out of pocket costs. And I would finance this partial compensation out of a temporary consumer tax on dairy products as Australia did, maybe a 10 year, 10 cents a litre tax on dairy products. And I would also ex impose a temporary tax on exporters, not of dairy products, but other products who gain as a result of concessions that our trading partners are prepared to make in return for our concessions on dairy products. So you're the winners, you're gonna have to help finance uh, the, uh, some kind of partial compensation package here. Let me turn um, to immigration policy. I mean, trade policy, uh, agricultural policy, it's about moving goods across borders, right? Agricultural products. I'm talking about people moving across borders. As one can observe just by reading the daily newspapers, the challenge of adopting more liberal immigration policies to, mit, to permit people to move more freely across borders, historically and today, has proven much more difficult than freeing up the movement of goods across borders. 
of goods or capital, I would add. Uh, we've, in the EU, of course, even before the current humanitarian crisis as a result of the massive influx of refugees from Syria and elsewhere in the Middle East, there have been severe tensions over allowing free movement of people amongst the uh, members of the EU, particularly the recently acceded members in Eastern Europe where concerns in countries like France or uh, Britain have tended to focus on cultural incompatibility, uh, adverse labor market effects, depressing wages of uh, local people, or uh, immigrants moving from Romania or Bulgaria or whatever just to access um, you know, welfare benefits or the like. And we see in the U.S., as I'm sure most of you are aware, uh, just from following the current uh, um, campaign, uh, primaries, uh, there are sharply divergent perspectives on immigration policy in the U.S. Um, um, despite the fact that I think most informed observers regard current U.S. immigration policy as grossly inefficient and grossly inequitable. Now, fortunately, this is an area where I think Canada stands out compared to Europe or the U.S. as something of an exception with relatively liberal immigration policies and public opinion polls that regularly report over a number of years a fairly strong public support for policies roughly as they are. But this, is, um, this I think, uh, stands as an exception to the uh, conflicted public policy debates on immigration policy in other countries. Now again, uh, thinking of the analogy with trade policy, if countries want to liberalize their immigration policies, an emphasis on gradualism seems to be key. Again, that's the lesson we learn from trade policies. You don't cut tariffs from 50% to zero overnight. So for me, a slow but substantial expansion of temporary visas for highly skilled workers and their families would, according to most uh, studies, benefit both the immigrants and recipient countries enormously. Probably in the case of less skilled or unskilled workers, a more cautious uh, approach to liberalization is called for so as to mitigate adverse labor market effects on unskilled workers in this country, where the kind of spillover benefits associated with bringing in highly skilled workers may well be absent. But for me, uh, any temporary work visa program, whether for highly skilled workers or less skilled or, uh, workers, ought to provide a clear path to permanent resident status and finally uh, citizenship. That is, there should not be a second class uh, category of workers who are only here for a few years and then we uh, kick them out. Uh, but immigration policy, you can see, is an area where it's too easy to think in zero-sum terms. Uh, you know, and I'm, um, you know, Donald Trump is going to build a fence, right, across the uh, south of the U.S. on the border with Mexico and have Mexico pay for it. This is news, right? And he's going to deport the uh, deport the 11 um, um, million illegal immigrants in the U.S. 11 million of them, right? Just ship them out. Uh, this is kind of zero sum thinking. N neither of these options is going to happen, right? You know, they're both crazy. Uh, uh, but again, thinking through how we could shift policy gradually over time to remove some of the worst inefficiencies and inequities would be the way I would think about it. I'm mindful of the time here. 
Um, mortgage interest deductibility. This is, again, a U.S. problem, but I think uh, we could find the, uh, uh, comparable examples here. In the U.S., homeowners can deduct interest on their mortgages from their taxes. Most other developed countries do not permit that. Canada does not permit that. This, again, is highly inefficient and inequitable. It overstimulates demand for housing, causing housing bubbles. And it's highly inequitable in that it confers most of the benefits on uh, wealthier tax pay uh, payers in higher marginal tax brackets. Right? How dumb could a policy be? And um, at a time when the U.S. is running a significant budget deficit, this, in terms of foregone revenue, is costing the U.S. somewhere between 80 and 100 billion dollars a year. This is an extremely expensive tax expenditure. Almost any serious person who's looked at this said, "This is where the welfare, eco our welfare economists, of course, make hay." They say, "We're looking at this. God, it's inefficient and it's inequitable." It should be cancelled, right? It costs 80 billion. Just cancel it. Well, I wish it were that easy, right? I mean, the assumption seems to be once the politicians wrap their minds around the 80 or 100 billion number, they say, of course you're right. We'll introduce legislation in the Congress tomorrow. They won't say that. So uh, how do we get out of this? Well, again, I think it cannot be an overnight thing. You could. I have argued for scaling down the tax deduction a few percentage points a year over a 10-year period. That's the way we did with tariffs, right? Take it down uh, to um, uh, take the deduction. Uh, so you can deduct 100% of your interest year one, 90% year two, 80% of your interest year three, and so on and so on until it the deduction's gone. Um, and, and you might back end load it a bit, so be a bit slow in cutting the um, deduction up front and accelerate it towards the end of the 10 year period. Here's another example uh, of how transition costs get in the way of, um, I think, uh, important policy reforms. Public pensions, both in this country and many others, uh, because of demographic changes, now pose major challenges of long-term fiscal sustainability. Most of these schemes are pay-as-you-go schemes, right? They're financed, payouts are financed out of current contributions, plus returns on um, any investments the fund has made. But with uh, increasing life expectancy, it means that retired folk are drawing pensions for longer, right? So there's larger claims on the pension fund. And because of declining fertility rates, there's a smaller working population to finance uh, these schemes on a pay-as-you-go basis, right? More beneficiaries, fewer contributors. You know this is this doesn't add up. You could say, well, old folk like me, you can have your, have your public pension, your Canada pension cut in half. I regard that as kind of tough on me. Right? Like at my age, uh, I, I don't have many uh, avenues to adapt to this. Like most people who retired, right? what, what are my ad adaptation strategies? I don't have any other source of income. I'm not, I can't easily go back into the workforce. So zapping people who are already retired by dramatic cuts in their benefits is, I, it would be political suicide as well as being, I think, unfair. But telling younger workers we're just going to double your contributions to pay for Trabilco's pension, that is also political suicide. Right? Why would these young folks, a lot of people in the audience, why would they stand for this? So a number of countries have found themselves between a rock and a hard place on pe public pension reform. Again, it has this kind of zero-sum quality to it. It's hard to find uh, winners, right? Uh, 
I argue here that what we need to do, and maybe it's not the only thing we need to do, but the first move I would make is raise the minimum retirement age when pensions are drawable uh, in gentle stages, in gentle stages, right? So you can't draw the pension, not at 65 anymore, right? Maybe it goes up to 60. 667, maybe eventually up to 75. 75 is what 65 used to be. At least that's the way I tell, my, that's what I tell myself. <laughs> uh, so to tell me I can't draw my public pension to 75, as long as I get advance, enough advance notice of this so I can adjust my uh, spending and investment um, policies accordingly, it's not so unfair. But you wouldn't do it overnight. And you wouldn't do it in one jump. Climate change policy. I'm, I'm nearly there. Climate change. This is surely the major regulatory challenge of our time. I mean, I don't have silver bullets. But look, we've spent 20 odd years since um, uh, the initial Kyoto Protocol was signed in fruitless international negotiations going nowhere. So uh, again, we seem to be paralyzed, right, in terms of making major uh, progress on, um, on this enormously uh, important challenge. So, uh, I, I, it seems obvious that major, even radical technological breakthroughs, at present only sketchily understood, are required in order to make major CO2 emission reductions both technologically feasible and economically bearable. Uh, so, um, <coughs> So we need substantial investments in R&D, and we need to incentivize these, and that seems uh, and to me and many others, economists actually on the left, Paul Krugman on the right, Greg Mankey, both uh, agree that what we want is, uh, what we need is increasingly stringent carbon taxes, right, that don't start you know, too high, right? Maybe start at 30 bucks a ton of CO2 and ratchet up through time, right? You can see the common theme in a lot of my suggestions. Don't close down whole industries overnight by hitting them with a $100 a ton CO2 tax. Start at 30 bucks, 35, uh, announce a schedule where these, uh, this tax will gradually increase. Uh, this will, uh, I think, is vastly better than the government picking and choosing technologies that they favor. We like wind farms, we like this, we don't like that. Locking in early technologies that are often not the most cost-effective way of dealing with the problem, which unfortunately the Ontario government has done in spades. Now, here's a key issue. Whenever you start talking carbon taxes or a cap and trade equivalent, you can design a cap and trade system that has almost all the same properties as a carbon tax. Uh, the problem quickly surfaces, well, okay, we'll get our dirty industries here to start cleaning up, because if they clean up, they don't pay the tax or they don't pay as much tax. So they'll have an incentive to clean up and invest in uh, new technology, R&D, and the like. But this obviously comes at a cost, right? The cost is either they pay the tax or they incur these, the cost of these technological and R&D expenditures. They say, we have a better option. We're just going to migrate to China. They don't have any of these um, taxes there. Either, either Chinese firms will expand and export, uh, in effect, dirty goods into Canada, or our firms will migrate there. I, so this, again, would be a disastrous policy prescription. Note, 
We've imposed enormous costs on our industries. We've had no effect on the environment because the CO2 emissions are just coming from somewhere else. And we've lost investment and jobs. Right? Can you imagine trying to defend that, uh, that kind of policy prescription? It would be a political suicide. So I have proposed, right, a as others have, a gradual, uh, graduated carbon tax that becomes more stringent through time. And, and this is the key point, a carbon tariff at the border of equivalent uh, magnitude on imported goods. So foreign countries either impose their own tax on these goods and keep the taxes, or we'll put the tax on the goods as they cross the border and we'll keep the taxes. You choose. You, the foreign country, choose. You impose a carbon tax like ours and keep the proceeds. If you don't, we will impose the carbon tax here and we'll keep the proceeds. I think, that, uh, and I'm amazed this has not become a more central feature of public debates. Unless we can deal with the carbon job and investment migration issue, where these all migrate to lax of jurisdictions, we will make no progress on the climate change issue. I predict this. The, uh, the the uh, pr problem of, of uh, leveling the playing field here is absolutely critical. Okay, last uh, vignette. In uh, institutional reforms and development. Um, here, uh, I have a colleague in the audience, uh, Mariana. Uh, Prado, who has uh, forgotten more about this topic than I ever knew, so I speak about it with appropriate diffidence. Uh, over the past two decades uh, or so, scholars, policymakers, international aid agencies have tended to converge on a consensus, particularly in the case of developing countries, that the quality of a developing country's institutions, its political institutions, its bureaucratic institutions, its legal institutions, are a crucial determinant of its uh, development prospects. This is a uh, perspective captured in the mantra, institutions matter or governance matters. Right, A poor country with a lousy set of public uh, institutions is destined to be poor forever. Think the Democratic Republic of the Congo as an extreme example with a per capita annual income of $400, one of the poorest countries in the world uh, with some of the richest natural resources in the world. I think there's a, a vivid example of why institutions matter or governance matters. So, uh, uh, reflecting this view uh, that a developing country, frankly, is going nowhere with lousy institutions, over the past 20 years or so, the World Bank, various uh, multilateral aid agencies, bilateral aid agencies, and so on, have invested vast amounts of uh, resources, financial, technical resources, in uh, many developing countries around the world in an attempt to improve their institutions, their political institutions, their bureaucratic and regulatory institutions, and their legal institutions like courts and the police. However, uh, I, I think a sober assessment of how effective these efforts have been is that the experience certainly to date has been mixed to poor at reforming these dysfunctional institutions in many countries has been mixed to poor. And just think of, again, con contemporary current examples. Uh, faltering efforts to institute democracy and the rule of law in countries such as Iraq, Afghanistan, similar efforts in uh, various Middle Eastern countries such as Egypt and Libya following the so-called Arab Spring. It's not so easy to fix bad institutions. 
And why is that? Well, again, we see that moving from a bad set of institutions to what, at least in principle, was a good or better set of institutions is not cost-free. There will be various losers. Uh, so imagine a corrupt uh, court system. Anyways, we want to improve it. Well, some people benefit from a corrupt court system, right? The judges who are receiving bribes, uh, litigants who are paying bribes to get favorable outcomes, they're not going to be strong, a strong uh, constituency if they're reforming the court system. Lawyers that have learned how to function with a modicum of efficacy in a dysfunctional court system are not keen to learn how to function in a different court system. So uh, switching costs, switching from one uh, type of institution to another imposes political economy costs. People who are on the take are not going to be uh, supportive of this. Uh, other switching costs, learning to function in a new institutional environment. It's like learning to function, as some of us did earlier in our lives, in the metric system as opposed to the imperial system of weights and measures not costless to learn a new system. Um, and uh, there may be um, um, switching costs associated with disruption to deeply embedded cultural beliefs or practices. People are become familiar with dealing uh, with a, a certain kind of institutional environment uh, and just um, resist, uh, find it uncomfortable to imagine uh, some alien set of institutions, right? The, their government has always been somewhat autocratic, led by a king or a sheik or whatever, telling them, well, democracy offers you all kinds of advantages, but for as long as the country's existed, that's the way the country's been governed. <coughs> that's what people are familiar with, they'd rather be governed by the King of Jordan or the, one of the sheiks in uh, Saudi Arabia than some new and for them strange um, system of government they have no familiarity with. So again, switching costs. How did we move from A, right, which seems a kind of a bad regime, to B, which seems in principle better, and address at the same time the folk that will either actually be or perceive themselves as being losers in that switch. So one's not prepared to think about these switching costs, one probably will never make the move, or at least uh, uh, not in any reasonable time frame from A to B, right? One will be stuck at A, even though most uh, reasonable observers would accept that B or something like B at some point in the future would be better than A. So in my uh, view, um, significant uh, policy reforms are politically feasible in many contexts only with political leadership committed to shrewd strategic combinations of transition cost mitigation policies, dealing with the losers, right? Not ignoring the losers, dealing up front explicitly with the losers from the policy or institutional changes. And astute, astute framing of the issues to the electorate, right? so, which I think is going to be key. For example, cases like uh, the dairy industry. How are, you going to, how are governments going to sell this to the electorate? How are they going to frame the issues so that the <coughs> the non-dairy farmers get a handle on this invisible 250% tax. And I think uh, politicians need to engage not only the material interests of a broad cross-section of the citizenry, but also uh, be, um, develop a capacity or exhibit a capacity uh, for engaging not only citizens' interests, but also their values, including some broadly held notions of fairness in burden sharing. It's not fair to ask the dairy farmers to take a $2 million hit per family, right, when we cancel this. I think most people understand that's not fair, right? 
uh, and I think in many of these contexts, politicians can, I think, uh, ought to be, need to be, capable of framing issues so as to, to point out to the electorate at large what's deficient about existing policies, why some alternative set of policies over the long haul would be better, and how we plan to get from here to there and deal with the people who, who in some sense, get caught in the switch. In uh, my book, Towards the End, I have a quote uh, which I must uh, include in the next draft of the paper, a quote I like, by David Lloyd George. I used to like this quote, now I think it's absurd. David Lloyd George, Prime Minister of Britain uh, from 1916 to 1922. One of his most famous uh, quips is the following. He is said to have advised some political colleague, don't be afraid to take a big step if one is indicated. You can't cross a chasm in two small jumps. The most dangerous thing in the world is to try to leap a chasm in two jumps. That's the advice. Uh, in many, perhaps no, uh, most uh, policy contexts, I find this unhelpful advice. It's true that attempting to cross a chasm in two small steps is likely to be suicidal. But as Lloyd George failed to acknowledge, the same is often true of attempts to cross a large chasm in one leap. You may end up in the middle of the chasm. So feasible policy options in many of the contexts I've discussed may often entail building a bridge around the chasm in stages, working around its uh, edges, uh, but uh, not attempting to get from one side of the chasm to the other in uh, one giant overnight leap. Let me come back to uh, William Wilberforce. Uh, one hopes that before his death, after a period, long period of chronic illness, and he died just days before the enactment of the Slavery Abolition Act in the House of Lords. But knowing that its enactment was now assured with these compromise provisions in it that I spoke of at the start of my comments, one hopes that he was able to take great pride and solace in the accomplishments that he and his fellow abolitionists had wrought, not because they achieved nirvana overnight, but because they marked important progress, despite the political compromises involved in dealing with the transition costs. But important progress in achieving a full human equality, racial, religious, and sexual, a quest that may never end. Thank you very much. I'm happy to field questions, but I'm going to sit down. Okay, thank you uh, very much for that presentation. It was uh, enlightening to hear your vignettes of models of how one might deal uh, with these transition costs. And I was interested in your immigration example because in some of the other examples you present, it's very clear where you have the kind of domestic constituency that you have to deal with. So when talking about the dairy subsidies, it's clear that if you don't find a way to mitigate those transition costs, you have a political problem on your hands with your kind of domestic electorate, with those lobby groups that have that kind of political power within the domestic sphere to, to kind of cause trouble for you. But when you're talking about immigration 
and immigration change, right. in some ways you're talking about a future constituency. So if you are changing immigration regulations, you're effectively excluding a future generation that won't even be there and actually has very little political capital to make trouble for you. And so I'm just kind of interested in what your observation is in how your ideas work in that case of, of immigration policy. Thanks. Um, you know, I, I think if, if one has to th uh, kind of disaggregate uh, the, uh, cl you know, immigrants as a group, right? There's, um, you know, highly skilled immigrants, less skilled or unskilled immigrants, there's refugees, there's uh, investor immigrants that by committing a certain, uh, making commitments to certain levels of investment and in business activities here can qualify. You know, the humanitarian crisis is not one that I address, the current humanitarian crisis in Europe is not one I address in the book, although I must uh, say I would, uh, as I think the, Brit uh, the um, public throughout Europe and elsewhere uh, come to recognize we ought to be, uh, err on the side of anything of being generous, right, to these uh, desperately impoverished uh, people. Um, but setting aside humanitarian crises and refugees, you know, in the general run of immigration policy, most immigrants are so-called economic immigrants, right? They're coming here because there are better economic opportunities than at home. That's why I'm here, I guess. Uh, so naturally, there'll always be concerns, well, aren't uh, these folk taking jobs from their locals? I think that concern is less acute in the case of highly skilled immigrants, because the argument is that engineers and scientists and so on, um, um, high-tech, R&D-intensive industries, generate a variety of spillovers that benefit um, a range of other workers. I, mean, I saw statistics recently that 30 or 40 percent of startups in Silicon Valley have been started up by immigrants, right? This is a huge number. And these generate all kinds of uh, economic spillovers for other people. I think just, you know, just bringing in more unskilled I know, workers in, from overseas in sectors where we have high levels of domestic unemployment, I think there, would, there will be a social and political reaction, don't you think? Uh, um, sectors that are low-skilled or semi-skilled, uh, where there have been major layoffs here, um, the unemployment rate is high. I think letting a, in a flood of additional workers from overseas would, I think, uh, cause a, um, a social and political um, you know, counter-reaction um, counter that uh, would be unproductive. Letting in engineers and computer scientists or even um, doctors, right? I didn't. I don't sense uh, major displacement effects, right? We're short of doctors, right? We could do with more computer scientists and so on. So I'm trying to look at where the rubber's going to hit the road, and I think if we started letting in uh, lots of low-skilled, unskilled workers that led to significant displacement effects or wage... Um, suppression effects for domestic workers already here, there will be a political reaction. So I would be more cautious. It's not to say I wouldn't move in a permissive direction. I'd be very cautious about it, though. Yes, uh, thank you. I'm Gordon McBain. I'm a professor at Western University or University of Western Ontario. I deal with climate change and those kind of issues. I uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, just you, you spoke about the emission reduction strategies and and dealing with winners and losers there. But I'm just thinking about the issue of the losers of the countries like small island states, developing countries, who are being affected by the emissions from countries like Canada, 
China, well, the, the Europe, the, basically the developed countries over the last 50 years that are making the, the climate change for the next 50 years? How do you deal with the losers in this kind of time delay response system where you've got uh, impacts based on what we did for the last 50 years affecting other countries for the next 50 years. So there are real losers who have nothing to do with, you know, who are not greenhouse gas emitters themselves. Yeah. Well, the climate, I agree with you, the climate, if you're trying to figure out all the losers uh, from climate change, is a long list, right? Countries like Bangladesh would say, we, even if you cut em emissions tomorrow, right? Uh, we're already at risk, we've already suffered damage, right? Um, from rising sea levels and, and the like. And of course, there's a kind of equity argument made that we, the developed world, created most of the problem, right? So that if we're asking developing countries like China and Brazil to major emitters, China uh, and India major emitters, to cut uh, emissions substantially, we should compensate them for this in some way. I, at some point, though, you can see where this is going to lead. It's going to lead to no progress, right? I mean, this is, this is, we now have 20 years of evidence of uh, policy paralysis. So what I have in mind, actually, is a, a more unilateral process, the big emitters, and I think we would have to start with the big developed country emitters, specifically the US, the EU, possibly Canada, would need to unilaterally adopt a kind of carbon tax I was talking about, along with a carbon tariff at the border, hoping that if you get a sufficiently significant, economically significant number of these big countries adopting this. This will incentivize countries like India and China and Brazil and others, in some sense, unilaterally to move in the same direction, right? They, they'll either have to pay the carbon tariff, or the only way to get out of paying the carbon tariff is to impose a carbon tax of their own. So, so I have in mind a scenario like that as an alternative to these jamborees every three or four years in Copenhagen or wherever you know, it's 160 countries and rock stars and media and uh, this seems to be a totally futile um, kind of circus. You know, this kind of top down, we're gonna negotiate. So I'm having, I have in mind a rather different approach. Um, start with one or two key developed country emitters who move unilaterally. And, don't forget British Columbia did this here. Move unilaterally, but the way to reduce the risk of moving unilaterally critically dep depends on the ability to put this carbon tariff on, right? So in Canada, this means the federal government would have to be a key player, which has shown no evidence uh, of, or the US Congress, right, which has shown no evidence of it. The EU is slightly more promising, I guess. You know, the e I mean, Joe Stiglitz proposed that the EU should put, adopt a reasonably stringent cap and trade system and then put a carbon tax on imports from the US, right, along with other countries. Uh, I think we need some move, some unilateral move like this, right, to precipitate a different set of international dynamics. Yeah, just I'm not disagreeing with your proposal on the emissions side, and just incidentally, I was the Canadian government science advisor in the Kyoto Protocol negotiations, which I say makes me the made me the most unimportant person on the delegation. But we won't go into that part. But just say I just think the other aspect, which is another a, a very different kind of loser situation, is something that we also need to. And I just wonder if you had some thoughts. I'm not disagreeing with what you're proposing. Yeah. I just spent an hour with Glenn Murray. That's why I'm on my way back from Toronto uh, with the minister. That's you should try. If you haven't done that, well, if you got a good hour, go ahead and do it. <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway, thank yeah, you. I haven't, I haven't thought. I, I haven't thought through all the losers one would have to address. But I'm think, 
you know, I'm not sure, on, uh, you know, in a number of my examples, I'm not fully compensating the losers, right? Eventually, the policy changes come, right? In my trade liberalization, after the tariffs are phased in, um, they're phased in, right? So, in very few of these cases am I saying, oh, or the dairy case, I would not pay them uh, the value that these milk quotas are trading for today in, this, in the secondary market. I would compensate them for the acquisition cost, the book value, right? The dairy farmers will scream blue murder, right? I could have traded these quotas yesterday for $2 million. It's true, I only paid a um, $1 million for it five years ago. So, uh, you know, this, this is where political compromise, strategizing, judgment calls, okay. can you sufficiently deflect opposition from the dairy farmers with this million dollar buyout and persuade the public at large, you're not throwing them to the wolves, right? You, you, it's a significant non-token measure of compensation. You're not cutting the 250 to 300% tariffs to zero next week, you say to the public, look, we haven't ignored the cost, we have not ignored the cost we've imposed on them, right? We, we've introduced the tariff cuts gradually and we've co partially compensated them. That's the best we can do. And the public will have to decide, is that, and we're, uh, in the public, you know, I proposed a temporary consumer tax on dairy products, like the Australian government, 11 cents a litre for 10 years. You know, we're prepared to, uh, we're prepared to contribute to the compensation, right? You've been, ra you, the dairy farmers, have been raking it in for 30 years. Um, that's all we're prepared to do. You don't regard it as full compensation. I'm sorry, that's, uh, so. I think in all these contexts, one would have to ask that kind of question. So in the climate change, we could probably uncover an almost endless stream of actual or perceived losers. But I'm really asking, not are you really a loser, but how politically salient are you, right? How important is it to deflate uh, um, your political opposition to where we need to get to, right? So uh, that's the key for me. Right? What do we need to do to r remove the roadblocks? So you, you may have a whole string of losers that, um, that really have no political influence on the outcome. I, my, in some sense, my book doesn't have much to say about them. I'm concerned about losers who have the ability to mobilize politically and derail a socially desirable reform project. So if, if you're a class of loser that can't do that, then for my purposes, I'm not principally uh, focused on you, right, so to speak. Um, my question relates to the trade point that you made. Um, so. I you mentioned reciprocity as one of the points that led to you know, the success in the trade regime. Um, how do you see that um, as it relates to unilaterally disarming? Uh, as it, what, sorry? Unilaterally um, you know, reducing tariffs, even if there's no reciprocity on the other side. So this, this is not, I think this is on the periphery of your book, um, because you mentioned reciprocity as something that's that's good in that uh, what you lose in the export market, you gain um, in the, the, so if, if Canada loses uh, by the fact that, um, you know, we're, we're, in, we're reducing tariffs, therefore the, you know, the market in Canada is, is reduced, then other countries would also have to reduce their tariffs and therefore we, we benefit on the export. But if that's not attainable, if other countries are not willing to reduce tariffs, is it in the interest of, say, the Canadian government to unilaterally reduce the tariffs on, say, dairy You're products. talking about these local uh, sourcing requirements that are yeah. in the, they're a matter of uh, dispute, right, in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Yeah. 
Well, again, we, we've identified a class of losers, which would be automobile component manufacturers who are based in Canada, the U.S., or Mexico, who stand to lose business and, um, and um, uh, generate job losses if Japan and other countries can source the components outside the group of eight countries. Well, I think they are they uh, they are heavily mobilized, and I think they're going to have to be. Um, there's going to have to be some compromise on this. I, my guess is uh, they're talking. Um, I don't know. I think I saw in this morning's paper. You know, there's thousands, tens of thousands of jobs. I, um, Japan is going to have to um, pull its horns in on this issue, right? Now they may. You know, trade negotiations are, uh, are horse trading, right? So Japan may say, well, if you don't allow us to source component, automobile components from wherever, Thailand or whatever, then we're going to withdraw some other concession. And I don't know what they were saying. We're going to open up some market in Japan to something from North America. So we're going to... We're just, presumably that imposes some more uh, costs on somebody else, right? some export sector that thought it would have an enhanced opportunities in Japan just finds that uh, this opportunity has been withdrawn. I, I would say, just add though, a lot of the uh, recent behavioral economics literature tends to uh, emphasize from all kinds of psychological studies that people put a much higher weight on out of pocket losses than foregone opportunities. So that if I'm actually losing a job I have, I'm going to put a much greater weight on that than not being able to realize a future economic opportunity that may now be denied to me, right? So exporters who lose an opportunity in the Japanese market because Japan pulls some concession well, it's not an opportunity in hand, right? It's not a bird in the hand yet. It's an opportunity that they thought they had that is now foregone. I would be inclined to weight that less than actual job losses of folk that are here now working in the automobile um, components business. You know, I should probably... Uh, I see an online question. Do you foresee policy transition politics playing a large part in the upcoming Canadian election? Is election rhetoric damaging to achieving gradual policy change? Uh, from Susan in Ottawa. Uh, just to answer the second part of that first, um, 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 Amy Gutman and a co-author in a recent book called The, um, the Art of Compromise, she says that campaigning leads to candidates taking extreme sort of simple, you know, one-line solutions on things. This is what you call, are calling election rhetoric. You know, we should do this, it'll achieve that. Simplifying things, you know, silver bullet, one-liner solutions. So I think in that sense, election rhetoric does damage, you know, sensible, measured policy change. It's not maybe dramatic, right? It doesn't produce benefits and costs and large quantities in the short run that is achieved, you know, over a 10 year. You know, 10 years for a politician is like eternity, right? Okay. And most politicians have a uh, time horizon of four or five years. You say, look, over 10 years, if you, you tackle this problem gradually and aim to get from A to B over a 10-year period, as opposed to doing nothing, right? Doing nothing, that's bad. Or attempting to get from A to B tomorrow, which will cause political mayhem, right? Um, it's not clear to me that all, all politicians would say, let's just take the slow, steady path over 10 years, 
uh, ten years. I said, my God, what are you talking about? That's, uh, that's uh, never, never land for me. I've got to get elected four or five years from now. Yet, having said that, don't forget, I've cited examples where in the trade policy context is the most striking, where despite maybe short time horizons by governments, they were able, I think, very effectively to adopt this policy of gradualism. And tariff cuts phased in over eight or 10 years. And a number of countries have reformed their public pension system by gradually raising the minimum retirement age. Edge it up a little, right? So it, it's, I think I, I'm not entirely, I'm not entirely uh, uh, sort of defeatist over this, uh, over, you know, longer term um, transition um, strategies. I think where it's going to, the rubber's going to hit the road in this election campaign is if in the next week or two, the final Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations come to a head and the result is in the general elements of the agreement are announced in the next two or three weeks. And it turns out the dairy farmers are going to take a significant hit. I think this, um, I would see a transition politics playing a central role uh, in the election campaign in that context. Hi. Um, so I'm. I think the, the talk was uh, quite fascinating, uh, and I uh, really find the idea uh, of compensating the losers compelling in principle. Uh, it reminds me of back when I learned about Pareto optimization in economics and always wondering in the back of my mind, okay, things are getting better, but no one's, winners aren't compensating losers. How is this ever going to work? Um, but I think that leads to a second question, which is also in principle, or, or piece which is in principle, how do you decide who gets compensated? Um, so in some of the cases that you brought up, for example, with the zoning changes, it's very easy to tell the specific people whose property is being grandfathered into a new zoning law. Whereas with something like carbon taxes, you're looking at very complex environment, very complex economic circumstances where it's often difficult to tell who to compensate and you see like what happened in British Columbia with the approach of essentially a carbon tax with just a universal dividend given, a more general compensation plan. Um, so I'm wondering to what extent are there any principles for trying to figure out when it is better to more specifically compensate people versus something that is a more general uh, compensation? Yeah. Well, that's a great question, and uh, I, I've always been um, anxious to stress that for me, transition cost mitigation strategies do not consist only of express compensation. In fact, the most common transition cost mitigation strategies do not involve paying losers cash, right? They, they involve grandfathering certain classes of parties or postponing the implementation of new regulations to some date in the future, or ratcheting up the stringency of the regulations over time. So I think it, it is important to think, you know, I, I had reviewers say, well, when would Trabilco compensate? I keep res res resisting casting my argument in terms only of compensation. Most mitigation strategies do not involve writing people checks. Now, sometimes they do, or it can be a mix, right? So in my dairy farmer case, I'm pro I probably would write some checks, right? But I would also notice not um, cut the tariffs overnight, right? The, uh, so part of it is graduated implementation of the tariff reduction, say over a 10 year period. So you, you might say, well, what's the optimal combination of 
gradual tariff cuts and uh, explicit compensation. I, I don't have an algorithm, if you, right? Because remember, my, my ultimate test is would some combination of these policies get us from A to B where without these policies we're going to be stuck at A more or less indefinitely? That's the, and it, that's the, that's the only question I'm interested in. That is, and the answer to that in any given case is a political, I call the, the book's called the political, it's a political question, not something you can put in a mathematical algorithm. It involves holding your finger to the winds and say, have we done enough to not only persuade the losers that we're not ignoring them, which is one thing, but persuading the rest of the political uh, community out there that w we're acting fairly, right? So that they can feel uh, comfortable moving from A to B in stages um, and supporting some reasonable sharing of the burdens, right? So, and maybe I didn't stress that enough. But I think it's not just persuading the losers that you're not losing, because often they will we'll still be losing something, but persuading the rest of the electorate, look, we, we've dealt with the losers fairly, right? Maybe not comprehensively, we've dealt with them fairly. There are major advantages to you in moving uh, from A to B, and you should support this package of policies. I'm interested in your proposed solution of uh, implementing a carbon tax lo locally and then having carbon tariffs for imports. Um, how can this even work? Because in your first example, you have um, trade liberalization, and so you have a, uh, and so you have these uh, tariff agreements which say that you're not allowed to impose certain tariffs. And so why wouldn't the opposing countries who don't have your carbon taxes just say um, that's protectionism and that's a tariff and therefore that's not allowed under the trade negotiation rules and you can't do it. Yeah, there's been, uh, I mean, there's two levels of answers. Would it be legal to impose a carbon tariff at the border on imports under WTO rules? And there's some complicated legal scholarship on that. I, I teach trade law. I am persuaded that uh, if properly designed so that the burden on imports is no greater than the burden you're placing on your own industry, that this would pass challenge under the WTO. Would China or India like this? No, they wouldn't. But remember, I'm presenting them with a Hobson's choice. You can ship your dirty uh, steel, you know, made with coal-fired electricity to us, and you have two choices. Pay the carbon tariff that we would impose on our own steel industry if they made dirty steel, pay, uh, do that, or um, and, and we'll keep the revenue, or you impose a carbon tax of your own, and you keep, uh, of equivalent uh, proportions, and, and you keep the revenue you choose. I, what's unfair about that? Otherwise, this is a this is a, a classic race to the bottom, right? All the big polluting industries or leave uh, the jurisdictions that have adopted more stringent policies and migrate to these pollution havens. This, right? So we've done nothing for the environment and we have lost investment and jobs. Like this would be an absolutely insane policy prescription insane politically, economically, environmentally, so we can't do that. I think what the developing countries will say is, well, why should we be required to clean up as much as you, right? Um, through your unilateral imposition of this carbon tax, I think that's what they will say. Um, 
you're really expecting us to make the same efforts at abatement as you're making, and that's tougher for us at our stage of development. I think that's what they'll say. Um, and at this point, you know, the, the international politics, I'm, I'm focusing on the domestic politics. How, how can I get a domestic constituency here in North America on side? And I think the carbon tariff is key to developing political support here. International politics are more complicated. I think for smaller developing countries that are not significant contributors to uh, CO2 emissions, I would probably just exempt them from the, as, as we often do for less, uh, least developed uh, countries, I'd probably exempt them from the carbon tariff. Right? Um, we have all kinds of schemes that grant special prefer uh, preferences to least developed countries, so I would just view this as an extension of the preference scheme. So, so let, uh, don't impose that burden on them, but I cannot see how we can let major emitters like China and India, maybe Brazil, maybe Russia, but certainly I cannot see how we can say, admit to your heart's content, right? It doesn't matter. How, how, could, we, how could we possibly take that position? So the, the international politics will be rough, but in some sense, if you want to sell to our markets, you want to sell to our markets, these are the preconditions. It's not, it's not an outrageous position to take. That's what we say with uh, product safety, right? If you want to export your products to the Canadian market, you have to meet our health and safety standards. You can't sell dangerous chainsaws or contaminated food products or uh, pharmaceutical, you have to meet the same requirements as we impose on our domestic. That's well-established WTO law. We do it every day. So we're basically saying the same thing. If you want to export your steel and it's made with a dirty process, uh, that's no more acceptable to us than a domestic steel maker using a dirty process. You know, that's, uh, that's the position I would take. It may sound hard asked, but um, no more so than telling Chinese um, baby food manufacturers you can't put um, whatever they put in it, um, automobile coolant in your, your baby uh, formula, right, and pretend that it's something else, right? And uh, right? we don't allow baby food formula manufacturers here to do that, and we're going to impose the same standard on you. Right? That's what we did in that case. Michael, uh, thank you. Um, if change were easy, um, life would be really uh, simple, and many of us in this room wouldn't have a job. Uh, the whole <laughs> point of navigating change, as Michael has demonstrated throughout his career, as, as Una mentioned in her introduction, the whole point of navigating change is, is to understand that it involves winners and losers, it involves time, space, culture, institutions, and above all, people. And so what Michael has done in his rightly award-winning recent book is to sum up a whole career of, of uh, work and action on the subject of how we navigate change using the law, norms, economics, and so many other faculties to get us from where we know we should be because that's what leaves us all better off, but not without costs. Uh, the only other point I'd make is that navigating change is central to absolutely everything that an organization like CG thinks about, which is not just tomorrow's problems, but tomorrow's problems that affect everyone around the world. And by definition, that couldn't be easy to do. And so it's central to the work of a think tank.
like uh, CG. So thank you, Michael, for being so generous with your time this evening and all day. In fact, we had a very good private roundtable with him on law and development earlier today uh, with Mariana, so thank you as well. Um, thank you all for joining, both uh, in per person and online. Uh, the next CG event, um, I should mention it to you, even though it's not here, but it would be of interest to many of you if you, if you would tune in, is next Tuesday. And it's going to be held at Osgoode Hall in Toronto at York University, but will be online as well and features Robert Cox. And this is quite the story. I mean, many of you probably know this, but Robert Cox uh, took the Dutch government effectively to court on its climate change policies and effected change. And it's something that's being studied and likely to be emulated by many people in many different kinds of contexts and jurisdictions. And so we have an evening with uh, Robert Cox next Tuesday on the CG website. So hope to see you there. and then. Hope to see you at one of the other events that we will be uh, doing here in the, in the uh, auditorium as well. So thank you all and have a good evening. scholar in an attic uh, at a university. I've also, in many contexts, been an active participant in the policy reform process as a member of government commissions, task forces, research directors thereof, and so on. So I'd like to think I've uh, um, not only been able to pursue opportunities of thinking and writing about these things, but also been on the policy uh, front lines. And I've repeatedly been struck in many, if, if not most of these contexts, by the realization that diagnosing the ills of the status quo and imagining better policy alternatives, at least in their bro broad contours, uh, is not uh, often especially controversial. One can see that the status quo is uh, highly unsatisfactory or dysfunctional. One can imagine at least the outlines of a better world out there. But the real challenge lies in getting from here where we are to there. Over time, existing policies develop their own encrustations of institutions, vested interests, adaptive preferences, and expectations that render the trajectory of getting from here to there a major part of the policy challenge. Uh, as an aside, um, to tell you what the book is not about, uh, last week, I was complimenting a close friend and long-standing colleague at the University of Toronto in a recent book he's published in, by email and offering to send him the paperback version of my book, which uh, is about to be released. And he said, I've already been promoting it around the world, but I've been doing so by telling people it's a thinly disguised personal memoir of your life in this faculty, <laughs> dealing with people like uh, me and other colleagues. Uh, well, uh, uh, this book is not. and gentlemen. Welcome to the Center for International Governance Innovation, or CG as we say. My name is Una Fitzgerald 
and I'm the director of the International Law Research Program at CG. I would like to thank our public event sponsor, Wordsworth Books, for their ongoing support of the CG Signature Lecture Series. Thanks also to all of you for joining us at this event. Um, whether you are here in person or online, uh, joining us through the webcast. I just want you to know that following this evening's address by Professor Michael Trebilko, we will welcome questions from both audiences at the microphones at the front of the auditorium or through the live chat function on your screen. So please remember to state your name and to keep the questions brief. It is a great pleasure for me and an honor to introduce Michael Trebilko, who will talk to us today about his fascinating award-winning book, Dealing with Losers, The Political Economy of Policy Transitions. You may know that with this book, Michael won the 2015 Donna Prize for outstanding public policy, uh, an outstanding public policy book written by a Canadian. So who is Michael Trebilko? He is a professor of law and chair in law and economics at the Faculty of Law, University of Toronto. He's also been a visiting professor at Yale Law School, University of Chicago Law School, Harvard Law School, New York University Law School. He's internationally renowned in the field of law and economics, in addition to international trade law, law and development, competition law. About life uh, over the past four decades at the University of Toronto Law School, I wouldn't have the audacity to call it dealing with losers. <laughs> I would probably call it dealing with winners, the challenge of dealing with academic prima donnas and chronic procrastinators. <laughs> so I'm, I'm dealing with a, a number of, uh, uh, in my talk tonight and in the book, a number of um, highly salient public policy uh, dilemmas. But I start the book um, with, uh, I think, a very striking historical example of the problem of getting from here to there. The uh, long fight to end slavery, led by William Wilberforce, amongst many others, culminated in Britain with the enactment of the Slavery Abolition Act in 1833. This act made provision for a payment of 20 million pounds, almost 40% of the British budget at the time, in compensation to plantation owners in many British colonies. This is about 21 billion US dollars in present day terms. Moreover, only slaves below the age of six were initially freed, while others were redesignated as apprentices to be freed in uh, two stages a few years later. Uh, Wilberforce and many other abolitionists accepted that compensation and phased implementation was required to ensure enactment of the legislation, particularly by the House of Lords where plantation owners were heavily represented amongst the aristocracy. Now, this is a very uh, striking uh, case uh, and it, um, I think it sheds light on many contemporary public policy issues. Whenever governments change policies, whether they're tax policies, expenditure policies, or regulatory policies, even when the changes on some reasonable view are on balance or on net. Economic and social regulation and contract law and theory. And he has published widely in all these topics. Professor Trebilko came to Canada in 1969 as a visiting associate professor of law at McGill Law University and joined the University of Toronto at, in 1972. Before McGill, he was a law professor at the University of Adelaide in South Australia. Prizes that have been won by Professor Trebilko are numerous. I've already mentioned that he's the 2015 Donna Prize winner. Uh, in 2015, sorry, that was 2015, 
He also has won this year the J.J. Barry Smith Doctoral Supervision Award from the University of Toronto in recognition of his outstanding performance in the multiple roles associated with doctoral supervision. And um, in the International Law Research Program, we have uh, a couple of students who, um, a postdoc and uh, one of his doctoral students, and all we hear is glowing praise for uh, Professor Trubilko from these students. In 2010, Professor Trebilko won the Ontario Premier's Discovery Award for Social Sciences. In 1998, he won the Canada Council Molson Prize in the Humanities and Social Sciences. He's a recipient of the Warren Owen Prize in 1989 um, for legal research for his book, The Common Law of Restraint of Trade. He has been elected a, professor, a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada in 1987, and he was elected an honorary foreign fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1999. Michael Trebilko and my paths have crossed at times, but never more so than since I joined CG a year and a half ago. Um, he is widely regarded as a great doctoral supervisor, but I did not have the fortune of having him as my supervisor. Um, but I must say that since I came to CG, I am seeing more of Michael Trebilko in his many roles, both as a supervisor of students and also as a, a great thinker on issues of international law and economics. Now, when I read Michael Trebilko's book, I realize that our interests converge to a considerable degree on the interesting questions about how to progress on challenging global issues while fairly addressing the interests of losers in policy transition. Having myself been inside the sausage factory of government policy making and seen the practical difficulties in making policy reforms, Michael's pragmatic approach speaks with great resonance to me. Michael's reflections on international trade, climate change, and law and development will be invaluable to the International Law Research Program as we pursue our policy-focused research on challenging questions of international economic law, international intellectual property law and innovation, and international environmental law and related cross-cutting issues. Michael's work shows us the importance of vision, strategy, opportunity, and compromise in making progress on some of the toughest political, social, and economic issues confronting global society today. People speak of wicked problems. Well, wicked problems call for wicked solutions. And Michael Trebilko shows us you, that you have to roll up your sleeves and get dirty to solve problems, such as reversing climate change, with equity, prosperity, and solidarity. I invite you to enjoy his presentation, and may it strengthen your own resolve in addressing the many intractable problems we face. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Una, for that enormously uh, generous and, uh, and uh, excessively flattering introduction. And thank you ever so much to CG uh, for the honor and privilege of um, presenting this lecture tonight. Uh, I have spent uh, much of my professional career researching, writing, and teaching about the policy reform process in a wide range of uh, policy contexts. But I have not uh, just been a 